Okay, well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your greatness. We thank you for preparing us for the life which is yet ahead for us all. We pray that you would establish our feet upon the very rock that sustains us. Increase our faith, Lord, and help us to understand the burden of the Holy Spirit that we might cooperate perfectly. Pray that you would bless this night and keep us in peace, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are up to chapter 15 of the book of Revelation. And it begins with, I saw another sign in heaven. So it's almost like a panoply of uh, different presentations that are visual. And it's almost like watching a, a large screen. So another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. So the word plague there is, is a little, doesn't quite capture everything because to us plague is like a sickness, like the bubonic plague. Um, but, but the word plague has in with it the sense of striking, of hitting, of um, attacking, uh, rendering a blow. So it just it isn't uh, based on sicknesses. It's based on God's dropping the hammer, so to speak. So the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So the Lord is um, very patient. And when this day finally comes, it um, he takes steps that he has taken from time to time in time past, but now this is universal, this is global. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And this is the second time we've seen the, uh, the, the sea of glass. Um, we saw it right at the beginning. That's where the elders are. And uh, uh, I think the idea of glass is that it's smooth, it's transparent. Um, there, there are no flaws. It doesn't interfere. Um, and uh, I don't know if you remember the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Uh, the second verse says, All the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. And so uh, I think the hymn was written in the early 1800s. The notion that it's a sea of glass opens and, and we'll see there are episodes in the sea from time to time and i think we've already seen one or two but the thing about the ocean is that it it's huge it's grand and uh, unless you're nautically minded uh, we rarely are on the ocean where you can't see any land and, but that's the, that's the fare of the sailor and the, the merchants. And so one interesting thing about the sea is that its waves are caused by wind. If there's no wind, the sea is perfectly calm. Uh, but as wind grows, the ripples grow. And because of the structure, the, the physics of it, uh, as wind is blowing, it can create something called a harmonic where um, the waters add up at various places in space. And so uh, the harder the wind, then the, the, the greater the waves. And so I think that's letting us know that the mechanism of the sea for us is that it's the moving of the Holy Spirit 
that creates the drama that we hunger for. And also that we ourselves can cause the uproar in spiritual life. So I think that's why the saints um, are upon the glassy sea. It's transparent, it's tranquil, nothing is destructive. They're totally in the spirit and they're serving God. And so when the Lord wants to communicate that he's thrusting out against the mechanism of the sea, we see it, uh, he'll turn the sea to blood or everybody in the sea dies. Another attribute of the sea is that it's the source of water for rivers and streams and lakes. Uh, the river streams and lakes empty into the sea, but the weather pattern lifts the water uh, out from the ocean and with storms that come off the ocean, uh, then create rivers and streams. So there's sort of, there's kind of a dependency. It's, uh, it leaves the impression that the sea itself is uh, a source. It, uh, it's the beginning of a process. So I saw, as it were, a glass, a sea of glass mingled with fire. You know, the last time we saw the sea of glass, it wasn't mingled with fire. And so this, this indicates that the Lord um, accompanies the saints with the sense that their works are tried and tested. And the Bible says that our works are burned up by fire. And so the fire of God is constantly present and depending on the movement of the Lord and depending on our demeanor of uh, repentance, that fire then burns within our heart, not only by the love of God, but by uh, uh, the burning up of the works of the flesh. So I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast. And so here's a number of components that the beast is just is not something simple, it's compounded. And there are various attributes that have to be understood and addressed and resisted and overcome. And so they got the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name. And these stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And so uh, we focus on uh, the number of the beast, but the beast itself is is something that needs to be contended against. And then there are things that the beast does. It influences the world uh, through the process of imagery or through the process of uh, uh, putting on a show or uh, using psychology to convince people to take uh, action. It's hidden. It's It's not the real thing. And then his mark, of course, remember the mark on the hand or, or on the forehead and the number of that mark. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God. And, and so this is not the same as the one that's in Exodus. The one, the song of Moses in Exodus is, um, I think it's like 18 verses long, whereas this one is uh, much shorter. So it seems to me that it's a, a it's like another verse. It's uh, it's it's compended uh, to the original song of Moses. It's being added to from the point of view of the saints that participate in the last days, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, "Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true your ways, Thou King of Saints." And so, giving honor to the Lord is the occupation of the saints and learning how to do that is it's not always present there is a fatal mechanism in church activity where people attend in order to watch and, uh, and if you kind of look around they're watching but they're not participating who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you only are holy, for all the nations shall come and worship before thee, for your judgments are made manifest. And for me, this is a, another hint of, of, uh, of an end time revival, or at least a revival at the very last day, where all the nations come and worship before God. 
and I'd like to see our doctrines modified so that it includes um, the path of not just focusing on the tares, but that the wheat is growing as well as the tares. And then when the time comes, the, uh, the tares are removed. And my observation in modern Christianity is, is a total focus, focus on, the, on the tares. And after that, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. So I think this opening indicates this is like the beginning of, an, of another process. And it's a process that prohibits um, earthly activity. It's almost as though the Lord puts the body of Christ on hold while he himself acts in, in, uh, in the manner that's being described. And so uh, the implication is that for a period of time, our activity in the kingdom of God is just simply put on pause. And he's the one that then steps up and it's his honor and it's his glory and it's his fierce judgment that then becomes prominent. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen. So that indicates that their behavior is holy and girded with golden girdles. That's the, uh, uh, the, the girding of yourself has to do with righteousness and the girding of your loins has to do with the capacity of being able to replicate your holiness, to bear fruit. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who live forever and ever. So now the, uh, these vials before were used, one to carry up the contents of the prayers of the saints, and now it's reversed, and now the wrath of God is going to be established on the earth. Very severe, very punitive. And as we'll see, it does no good. It does not. Uh, there's a kind of a feeling that he who will repent has already repented by now. Uh, and so now it's the worst of the worst who are left and they just lift up their fist in anger and they will not repent. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. He's, he's, he's not sitting back any longer. He's, he's arising, he's on his feet and from the power. And no man was able to enter into the temple. That's why I, I, it, it feels like business is shut down, uh, at least for, for a season, why he himself takes charge. No one's able to enter the temple. So the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So I have two scriptures here uh, that add an important element to the notion that he is stepping up in, uh, in anger. The first is Isaiah 28, 21. It says, for the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim and shall be wrought as in the Valley of Gideon that he may do his work, and this is the point, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. God is not comfortable, it's, it's not a, in his nature to be fierce and to be punitive and to pour out uh, fire and blood and death and uh, uh, bringing doom to the ones that are the, the target he considers it something he's not comfortable with and a similar idea comes from ezekiel 33 11. say unto them as i live says the lord i have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live turn ye turn ye from your evil ways for why will you die o house of israel so his posture is one of Great mercy, great. The, the, he has such a great capacity to forgive. And even 
we who do better sometimes and not other times. He's patient. He, he knows the end from the beginning and he doesn't see personal failure as, uh, as, uh, as a hindrance to his work, but rather personal failure, if we receive it properly, uh, leads us to repentance. It leads us, I don't know, Lord, I really am nothing. Here I thought I was swift and had it all figured out. And then there I, simple test, I failed. And, and quite handsomely. And the knowledge that then we can turn to the Lord and change, repent, change, turn away from it and find the, the, the delightful process of growing in the Lord and being transformed into his image. Chapter 16. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying, to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image. And so God's judgment now is pinpoint. It hits the very, it's not like a general, uh, like COVID, it, you know, it hits many and it seems like it's haphazard. This is razor sharp. These, these are targeted and they're targeted because of how they responded to the administration of the beast. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. So there's a reference again. And it became as the blood of dead men and every living soul died in the sea. And so the view that the sea among other things, represents the notion of how things begin and how things pr pr uh, progress, that this, uh, he brings death to that process. And it's, it's no longer able to produce, as we had mentioned, the, the source of fresh water, uh, which is used uh, by mankind. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of the waters, and they became blood. And so first the sea, and then the rivers and the fountains. And I heard the angel of the water say, so evidently there's an angel attached to the ocean and rivers and fountains. I heard the angel of the, of the water say, you are righteous, O Lord, which are and was and shall be because you have judged thus, you judged this way. And that I think will be our posture as well. We'll see the judgment of God and it's faithful, it's true, it's right, it's, it, uh, it's deserving, and it's measure by measure. The measure of evil receives the measure of judgment. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, so why not be <laughs> uh, tormented with the blood of dead men? And you have given them blood to drink. And so they are worthy, if they're worthy to receive the very thing that they administered to others. And I heard another out of the altar say, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. When we see God's judgment, one thing that affects you is you see how right it is. And I think that comes because we can see two things. We can see the evil that's being judged, and we can also see the level of judgment, and they match. It's a perfect match. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And so part of the judgment of God affects things that are part, that are part of the universe. And this could easily be literal, but I think it also is uh, uh, indicative that the heat, which is so useful in so many ways, there reaches a point where the heat is actually a torment and uh, uh, brings death. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God. So that's, there it is right there. They know it's the Lord, what they're receiving is just, but they don't change their mind. They blaspheme in the name of God, 
which has power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. That is purely satanic. This is a portrayal of our enemy at his very, very purest level and how he inflicts this dire hatred and vehemence against God and the things that are holy. They won't repent. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And so the beast is a complex process. There are a number of ingredients that are present in the beast. And the fact that there's a seat implies that uh, the beast has the capacity to rule. The, the beast is kind of like royalty. He has a dominion. And he is a, he's in a position where he can watch things as they happen. And his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, no relief. And blaspheming the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they repented not of their deeds. Here it is again. They won't budge. They won't budge. And the thing about it is, our instruction to be holy, our instruction to flee unrighteousness, you need to realize this is what you're contending with, this pure hatred. And sometimes the enemy masks himself in sort of a, a gentle way so that we're not, uh, we don't put up a strong wall. We just kind of step back and say, oh, well. But we need to understand the very uh, depth of his wickedness. And the sixth angel poured out of his vial upon the great river Euphrates. So Euphrates um, first was part of the eastern uh, border of David's kingdom. What we see in Israel now is only a sliver of what David had. Uh, David's kingdom went all the way to um, Baghdad, so to speak. And also the Euphrates uh they call that area the fertile crescent and it, it it looks like an upside down paper clip uh it's desert everywhere else except there and it's in a like a semicircle and it's filled with the ability to bring forth lush uh lush fruit and lush living and the water thereof was dried up so the lushness is gone that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So this is the emergence of more cruel rulership. And the kings have to be prepared. There has to be a sequence of things that makes it easier for them to step forward. And so drying up of this lush river is part of that process that empowers them. And I saw three unclean spirit like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And so here's, here's a threesome. And uh, they, they cooperate with each other and they have slightly different roles. They, uh, the false prophet, of course, is, is the spokesman of the beast and uh, makes it sound like he's not that bad. And of course, the beast himself is proclaiming using nuance and using imagery and using fair words, fair speeches uh, to convince the multitude of mankind to serve him. And we see that going on today. You change vocabulary, change the meaning of things, the meaning of life. And it's all ethereal. It's all it's not in the world of molecules. It's all in the realm of what is being spoken. And so that's, uh, that's the mouth. For they are the spirit of devils working miracles. And so uh, there's some chance that those miracles are lying miracles, because that, that's, a, that's a term used elsewhere, lying wonders. Uh, but in any case, they're convincing enough that uh, whether they are true miracles or not, they have the same effect on people, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world. And so the talk about new world order, uh, there is a sense of commonality, as I judge news events among the nations of the earth. 
and there's there's a very strange consensus as they work together and uh, and work and lift up one nation while they crush another the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them into the battle of that great day of god almighty of course this is armageddon so their cunning is they know it's gone and so they're just going to recruit and they recruit millions uh, but they're doomed behold i come as a thief the uh, he pronounces that uh, regularly through the scriptures and he also says that i will not come to you as a thief that day will not come to you as a thief blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments keeps them white lest he walk naked and they see his shame the ability to survive those days rest solidly on your willingness to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and i think we run way too lightly on that we uh you know i i asked for forgiveness i got it and i did it again it's uh, uh that's a demonic game and so petition the lord to be cleansed thoroughly so that there's nothing in you just like jesus you know, uh, the enemy has nothing in me and so we're called to that same uh, level and he gathered them together in a place called in the hebrew tongue armageddon and that's the valley of megiddo and if you've been to israel almost surely they will uh, take a tour of uh, the, the Megiddo Valley and there's a mountain there and uh, it just looks like a, a mound but actually when you go up to the top there's a tunnel that goes down very deep and you can climb down it there's steps and everything uh, which made that uh, the Mount Megiddo very uh, very uh, uh, defensible it was it was almost imp- you know the the villages would gather there at the base hidden and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying it is done and so when these mechanisms begin they they have a a sense of one event latches to another builds on it latches to another latches to another and that process comes to a, a point where it's complete and there were voices and thunders and lightning and there was a great earthquake <laughs> earthquakes occur regularly in the book of revelation and it may not just be seismic uh, activity but anything that shakes um, the processes of sin in the earth such as was not since men were on the earth so mighty of an earthquake and so great I'm not sure I could think of an of an equivalent, but um, something that the whole that all mankind buys into that is evil, and it shakes them when when that is judged and uh, and brought to nothing because it's their identity and it's uh, it's uh, it's mighty, it's great. And the great city was divided into three parts. I'm not convinced that that's Jerusalem. I think I think the, the better it would have been easier if the Lord had said Jerusalem. But the great city implies we've been introduced to this. So my estimate is that this represents the uh, the complete neighborhood and cities cities and valleys and buildings and structures all that is a city this greatness that this evil has produced and so uh that that greatness is going to be divided into pieces and the cities of the nations fell and great babylon came into remembrance before god to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And so Babylon comes up several times in the book of Revelation. And I don't think, 
I'm too out of sync. If I say that to me, the modern church is living in Babylon and we do our best to be neighborly and kind and not the restore, not re, uh, give evil for evil, but nonetheless, like Israel was uh, captured and taken into captivity, they went to Babylon and they lived there many years. And remember God, it was a Jeremiah talking about a hope and a future. He was talking about Babylon. And so for the people of God to be living in Babylon is not a strange occurrence, but a time comes and we'll see it shortly where the Lord will say to the bride, come out of her. I don't think it's happened yet. And every island fled away and all the mountains were not found and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a talent. I think that's, uh, that's a couple of pounds. And I heard the other day that some severe weather went across the southeast of the United States and uh, the size of hail was as large as a grapefruit. I've never, I've never seen anything like that. And men blaspheming God because of the plagues of the hail, the plagues thereof were exceedingly great. So they, uh, they just hate the Lord all the more. They know it's in response to what they do, but they're implacable. They, they will not change. Chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials and talked with thee, saying, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great horror that sits upon many waters. So here's another player, uh, Babylon the harlot. She lives deliciously. So he's going to demonstrate how she is judged. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. They're really into her. And uh, I think there are uh, evil proposals having to do with gender and things of that nature that are pure evil, pure wickedness. And I think it's, it's uh, this harlot Babylon, which is the author of it all. And, and the kings of the earth believe it. They cooperate with it. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. They don't even talk right. They, they, <laughs> uh, they don't understand words. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman upon a scarlet colored beast. So here she is, full of names of blasphemy. She just, that's her constant talk is to defy God and to defy the things that are holy and to insist that these holy things are replaced by things of debauchery. Having seven heads and 10 horns. So uh, so we've, I think we've seen that or, already twice. The idea of seven heads, the, the notion of uh, perfect thinking, of, of being able to plan and, uh, and execute plan. And then the 10 horns, 10 is uh, contrasted with 12. Remember the tribes of Israel, uh, 10 wouldn't go into the land of promise, whereas the two, Joshua and Caleb, would. So it, it has to do with the power of resisting God and the horns represent the ability to push against uh, anything that resisted. And the woman was arrayed in purple, she looks royal and, the, and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. So she's, uh, she's glamored and having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And so uh, I'm not uh, persuaded that this is a good time to narrate the, con the condition in our country now that are due to these things. But let me just at least hint very strongly that what we are seeing rising up now and just destroying children and education and so many uh, places and things that this is the motive, Revelation 17, 4. 
And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of all of harlots and abominations of the earth. So I don't know why the King James capitalized all that. I guess maybe they thought, you know, this is a title. So let's, let's, uh, they used to say on the internet, whenever you would type and use capital letters, you're shouting. So this is being put forward. Other translations don't do that. But it's a mystery. She's, uh, it's, uh, when you think it's zigging is really zagging. It, uh, it has cunning. Uh, it produces harlotry. She's the mother of harlots. And the abominations that, she, that you see on earth, of which we see abortion and other things, she's the mother of it all. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. That's her cup of tea. She stands constantly against. And so uh, I was just noting uh, a recent uh, news occurrence where the press just vehemently renounced uh, something a Christian man was saying to a group of Christians. And it was ungodly, but that's what it is. They're drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, uh, not that he says, I like this, and <laughs> it's that he's stunned by it. Uh, and an angel said unto me, wherefore do you marvel? I will tell you of the mystery of the woman and of the beast that, uh, that carries her that has seven heads and 10 horns, a repetition again. So she is being carried along by something which is larger, something at least for the time being is pleased to carry her. Uh, they give her animation, they give her power and capacity, but as you'll see, certainly they're, shortly they're gonna turn. And the beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And so this, remember I gave you the, uh, the up and down notion of the book of Revelation. And I didn't include this one uh, because I couldn't, I wasn't confident I knew where, where it landed, but it came, it ascended out of the bottomless pit and it kind of feels like it does a turnaround. It goes back into perdition. And so when this judgment happens, all will see it will wonder. And the ones who see it the greatest are those that are not written, written in the book from the foundation of the world. And by the way, that phrase, uh, the book of life from the foundation of the world implies that your name was written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. And the main idea is not, not get your name removed. So uh, God creates us with the sense of let's make this work. And I know there are going to be struggles, of course, because of Adam and the rest of that. But uh, it's not that through our Christian behavior, we then reach an achievement of having our name added to the book of life. No, the whole trick is to keep from having it erased. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And so that's a, that's a mis a mystical expression. It was there in the past, and yet it's, uh, it wasn't, and yet it is. And it's, uh, um, I think the Lord is enig enigmatic because he wants us to see this isn't something easy to figure out. You can't name a country and say that's the beast or name a political move or something like that. It's in and out, it's elusive, it's there and it's not there, but it really is there. So that alerts us that we need to be all the more careful when we're observing uh, the activities of the world. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads, remember she sits on the beast that has seven heads and 10 horns. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits so some are very quick to say it's got to be rome because uh, it was founded on seven uh, hills uh, but i'm not convinced of that it um, the sense that the sense of a mountain is that 
it itself has great prominence. It's something that is notable. It's something that you can climb. Maybe you make it, maybe, maybe you don't. Um, and the woman is sitting on those mountains. She receives her uh, wisdom. Let's see, the heads are seven mountains which, are, uh, which, which the woman sits. And I don't think there's a hint that it's some sort of religious organization. This is totally humanistic and totally cunning and demonic. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and I don't know who those five are, but they're gone. One is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. And so Daniel and elsewhere describes, uh, I don't use the word political, but it's, uh, it's an arm wrestling between political powers of stepping up and being pushed back and being in and then being out. And the beast that was and is not, same idea, even he is the eighth. Uh, so my guess is that's the eighth king and is of the seven and goes into perdition. So the fact that he has this prominence, it doesn't count. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings. And we've seen the sense of that, which have received no kingdom as yet. So these are kings with no kingdom. Uh, so I asked the Lord one time, I was at a, I served on a jury on a case that lasted well over six months. And so when it came time for lunch, I didn't join the rest of the jury at, uh, you know, different restaurants or whatever. I, I just took my lunch and took it in. There was a, a law library there. So I went in the law library and I read and so forth. And I was reading Revelation then when I came to this verse, I said to the Lord, what does it mean for a king to have no kingdom? That kind of isn't fit. And the Lord said to me, you're looking at it. And so I'm looking around. I don't see it, Lord. He said again, you're looking at it. And so my eyes were, had fallen upon the very thing he was talking about. And it's not that it's a, you know, an, something that is identical but it gives the very sense of it. What I was looking at was a magazine rack of all these different functions of fashion and uh, politics and whatever, showing all of the dimensions that surround us with, um, with creating an appeal for it. It's almost as though it preaches to it. It, uh, it wants us to join it and so that's the realm of these kings. It's the, it's the realm of influence, the, the realm of persuasion, the realm of ideas and words, not, not the realm of behavior and uh, things that are clear. And these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And so they're, it's almost like the collection of news agencies that just kind of join forces together against uh, the, the, their perceived enemy. You shall make war with the lamb. So no, no ifs, ands, or buts. They know what the enemy is. And although they speak of kindness and whatever, you know, the, these are in love, so we can't stop them kind of thing. And so they make war with the lamb. They go to task against them. And we see that today as it's just going to increase to a mighty crescendo until we reach a verse like this. And the lamb will shall overcome them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. So here in one snapshot is the, is the picture of all history and all mankind. And that is the, the desire of these beasts and these kings and the, 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 the crowns and the, uh, the heads plotting against the Lord, desiring to overcome him and overtake him. And so it's just not going to work. And the criteria for following the lamb is a very simple one. They're called, they're chosen, and they're faithful. Those are three 
very important ingredients. We must be sensitive. What is it that the Lord is asking of us? What is he drawing us into? And when we hear it, we are faithful to it. And when he sees that fruitfulness, when he sees that faithfulness, he puts his seal of approval upon it. And it, it places you in a realm where uh, what you think and what you feel matters. It counts. It's true. It's pure. Uh, the enemy will wrestle against it, but it's, it's part of what you are now. You, it's like almost like you've been coronated. You're, uh, the Lord has touched you and said, yes, 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 this is it. And of course, the faithfulness has to do with our unrelenting obedience to the Lord and not, uh, and not giving up. And when we do give up and somebody points it out, we get right back up to the battle again. And he said unto me, the waters which you saw were the whore sits and peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues and the ten horns which you saw upon the beast these shall hate the whore so so now there's a real it's a house divided against itself and jesus said it has to fall well this cooperation between the, the harlot and uh, and the beast has been going on for thousands of years and now we're witnessing a breakup the the, the beast has hated her all along but has found her uh, useful. But in the last days, uh, they're gonna change their mind. And so they're gonna redirect and, uh, and destroy her if they can. The 10 horns which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. That is the intensity of their hatred to her, which is almost, you know, it's a house divided. Um, you know, she cooperated with every form of evil and they desired her cooperation of every form of evil. But yet there's something, uh, maybe it's because she lives deliciously. Where is the Proverbs that says uh, the harlot wipes her mouth with her hand and says, I've done no wrong. And so it's, that can get that kind of arrogance can get to you. So I think they finally say enough, you know, you know we're we're going to pursue our, our goals without her. For God has put in their hearts to fulfill as well. So they're being led by the Lord and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And so that's another thing that helps us not to be fearful of the days in which we are. It's um, uh, Lord is in perfect control and he does not allow any wickedness that is not part of his entire purpose. And of course, at the very end, all wickedness will be destroyed. And the woman which you saw is that great city. So here's another place of, uh, of rulership. I'm not sure it's Jerusalem. Uh, most people do. Uh, but this is where Babylon, uh, this is where the harlot has her say. She's, uh, she's in a walled city and there's uh, deliberations there and ventures and determinations. And that's where she lives. And that reigns over the kings of the earth. And again, I don't think... Um, I don't know of any other function that has that power over the whole earth other than those things that are in the spirit. And uh, uh, abortion is, is a really grand example. Of, you have a great contest between the majority, which delights in it, delights in murder of children, uh, just like uh, Balaam and uh, Herod and Pharaoh. Uh, and so that that spirit rules them it it has say over them and takes their understanding and their determination and crushes it so that it conforms chapter 18 and after these things i saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lighted with his glory so there's another hint that god's not done farming, inviting, 
those that are in darkness to come to the great light. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And so she is overcome. She has no more power, but it becomes something else. It still becomes a haven of something that is uh, quite similar to what she is. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So that's, um, we don't have any nation that is ruling all nations. It's all in the realm of ideas and plans and purposes. That's where true rulership occurs, uh, convincing people. And so uh, when you drink that cup, uh, you are inebriated with the concepts that introduce you to the cup. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now, I'm not quite sure what that means, other than there's evidently a wickedness that related to the harlot in the realm of c commerce. And it may be the manipulation of prices or, uh, you know, where the you know, the rich get richer kind of an idea. Uh, I was thinking the other day, the salary of a congressman is just under 200,000 a year. Notable amount, but not wealth. And yet they all retire millionaires and billionaires. So how does that happen? <laughs> it's because they're engaged in a in some sort of merchandising, buying and selling and creating great name using their own capacities. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense. They're getting paid for something. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. So this to me, this cry to come out of Babylon is a late occurring message to the church. And so I, I, if you can see that, it just kind of helps you to hold steady when you see things that are uh, disconcerting in the, in the religious realm. You're just seeing the contamination of Babylon in the church. And so until we come out from that, um, the inference being coming out of her because her doom is soon, if not already passed, but it also represents the fact that we are leaving something trying to be a help, trying to minister, trying to assist uh, for those he that has ears to hear. Uh, but there comes a time when we're done. For her sins have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. It's, it's just, it's now become too much. No more time for grace, no more time for mercy, but a plague, a hammer. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she has lifted up, fill to her double. So she has caused great havoc and death and sorrow, and the response in the spirit to that is to be twice as heavy-handed back to her and to judge her fully. How much has she glorified herself? And that's, uh, that's a characteristic of these spirits that try to obtain dominion in, in different ways, whether it's commerce or politics or school districts or whatever. And live deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she said in her heart, I sit a queen. <laughs> I am involved. You can't get me. And I'm no widow and shall see no sorrow. Boy, oh boy, she hasn't read the Bible. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day. That's how sudden this process is going to be. Death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And so 
there are times when we see nations topple from uh, wicked rulership and there's a change in administration that's now uh, godly. But this is something that's going to strike at the heart of all of the evil in the world. And there's a decided link to those things that are uh, of commerce. That's a very odd uh, companion. And the kings of the earth, which have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. We had it going, you guys. And evidently, this is a different crowd than the ones that despised her, which was the beast. But the kings of the earth, those that have say in, uh, in the na international scene, uh, they're losing out. Standing all far off for the fear of her torment. And I don't want to get close to this, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, in one hour is your judgment come. It's, it didn't take long at all. There's a sense of suddenness. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. So there's that link to commerce again. There is a wickedness established somewhere. Um, we know there's manipulation in markets and things like that. Um, but this is a, a deeper handiwork where uh, the wickedness is tied directly to the notion of buying and selling. And of course, you have to buy low, sell high. And so uh, they sell high to us. And so we pay, we pay, the, we pay their fare. For no man buys their merchandise anymore. So something is going to disrupt the entire commercial system of the world, which will cause quite a struggle. The merchandise, so this is what they, um, what they trade in. And it's a very curious list. And I'd like to study it more thoroughly sometime because it seems to me that it's, it's a, it's a progression of sorts. And the astonishing thing to me is how it ends. So they have merchandise of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, and thyene wood, and all manners of vessels of ivory, and all manner of vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and sun, and, marble, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beast and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and the souls of men. And I often wondered if that's not a progression um, where the merchandise of gold is at one level, but the real the real burden in that which is evil is to buy and sell your soul. And that it becomes, they make merchandise of you. That's a scripture thought. They take your soul and they bargain and they uh, seduce. And it's part of their trade. Your soul is part of their trade. And so that's why uh, being alert to that, that will prepare ourselves even more. But what a way to end that list. And the fruits that your soul lusted after are departed from you. And all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from you. And you shall find them no more at all. So all of this that they had traded in and delighted in were just so good at and uh, manipulated markets and just had their own way, it's all removed. And the merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. So they know, they know they've been <laughs> shortchanged. They know that this great thing they had going is now crumbling around them. And saying, alas, for that great city that was clothed in fine linen, of course, that's Babylon, the, the harlot, and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls for in one hour 
one hour, so great riches has come to nothing. And every shipmaster, see the emphasis on commerce, every shipmaster and the company and ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea stood afar off. They can't do anything about it. They're going to be shortchanged the way they had shortchanged everyone else. And they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city? What a loss. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, alas, alas, that great city. This is the harlot. Where in were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness for in one hour, one hour she was made desolate. Rejoice over her, you heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets. This is yea for our side. For God has avenged you on her. All the things that you have been made deliberately at a disadvantage, uh, that's going to be righted at this time. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city, Babylon, be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. Her days are numbered. And the voice of harpers and musicians and pipers, you know, music's a big deal today, and trumpeters shall be heard no more in, no more at all in thee and no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in you. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. So their, divide, their uh, deceptive use of commerce is going to be exposed and destroyed. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, remember, come out, shall be heard no more at all in thee. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, and by your sorceries were all nations deceived. It's not easy to put your fingers on that now. There are suggestions of it but it is mostly occluded, it's mostly hidden, but it's there. And it's worryings like this that alert us to kind of take a little more care in our perception of uh, the affairs of the world. And in her was found the blood of prophets, that's what she does, and of saints and all that were slain upon the earth. She herself is the source of this treachery, this wickedness of uh, shedding the blood of holy men and women of God. Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the greatness of what you have provided for us. We thank you for the heads up, for the portrayal of things that are yet ahead of us, that even though they are spoken of quite mysteriously, Yet we can sense the connection between what we are sensing now and what we are seeing now and that which is to come, which is a fulfillment of what we see partly now. And I pray that you would equip us with strength and determination that we're going to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.